Jeff Baradelli is a CBS News meteorologist and climate specialist, and he does such an incredible job communicating the climate crisis every day on TV. So I'm very excited to have this conversation with him. Jeff Baradelli, welcome to the Climate Pod. It is good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, your focus is on both meteorology and climate science, and it's clear from your background that you really put in a a ton of work, even before you were on national television, to learn more about climate science. So how has your background and education guided your role as a meteorologist? Yeah, so first of all, I should say I've wanted to be a meteorologist since I'm three years old. So it's been going going way back, and I'm like 21 now. So, so it's like what, 18 years, 18 years and now getting out of here, but no, since I'm a child. Um, and, uh, you know, about five, six years ago, uh, I just noticed some changes on my weather maps that were really alarming. And I also noticed that the national media wasn't really covering this at all. And I thought to myself, why aren't the national media or local media? Why isn't anyone covering this? What's going on in the Arctic, especially was pretty crazy. So of course it occurred to me that I live in my little meteorology bubble and I'm looking at my weather maps, but no one else is. So I, I kind of set off on a journey at that point that would lead me here uh, to CBS News uh, to try to, to get the national media to take climate change more seriously and to try to educate people as to what I saw and what that meant, what kind of repercussions that, that, would, that would cause. And so I ended up leaving my job. I don't know if you know this, but I left my job I uh, had a very secure, could have been there probably another 30 year type job. Uh, and uh, my wife and I moved to New York with no, we had no job. I went to Columbia to get my master's degree in climate and society. And as I was there at Columbia, I worked hard to kind of get in the door here, especially at CBS News, so that I could start doing the work, which I thought was necessary for everyone to understand. And, and that's, that's what kind of brought me here. So you have a huge platform at CBS. What are your goals? What have you wanted to bring to your audience as a meteorologist? I want people to kind of grasp the enormity of uh, of the climate crisis Um, and get people to understand that their actions, their decisions especially, make a difference. And when I say decisions, I mean who they vote for, what companies they patronize, so what companies they buy from. Are those companies good stewards of the earth? Are they not good stewards of the earth? Um, I wanted people to understand how just a degree or two change in global temperature makes a huge difference. And when I connect the dots every morning to something like Hurricane Ida, which would have been a major hurricane anyway without climate change, but was made that much more powerful by climate change, or the fires in the West, which you know, every year we say this is unprecedented. Then the next year we come back and say this is unprecedented. Or the Pacific Northwest heat wave, which pushed the limits of physical science. <laughs> I mean, meteorologists, you would have never been able to convince a meteorologist that it could have hit 116 in Portland and 121 in Canada, but it did. So these are things that shouldn't happen, but climate change is making the impossible possible. So my goal is to kind of put that into perspective for people, let people let people see what kind of transformative impact climate change is having. And obviously that will only get worse in the future as long as we continue heating the earth. Well, for a long time, meteorologists on TV didn't talk about climate change, but rather just focused on preparing people for the immediate impacts of the storm. Why do you think that was? You know, um, First of all, it got politically charged for, for no reason. This is not a political issue, it shouldn't be. But of course it is a political issue now. Everything's a political issue now. Um, I think that a lot of meteorologists were cognizant of the fact that there were people in their audience who may not take kindly to them talking about climate change. I think there were a lot of meteorologists who were concerned that their bosses, even if most of their bosses thought climate change was important to talk about, that there might be a few that were totally anti-climate science that didn't believe that climate change was real. So protecting your job, protecting your audience, you know, you don't want to lose people in your audience, you lose popularity, you may lose your job. Um, Probably a decent number of meteorologists didn't think there were experts in climate change or knew quite enough to talk about it um, with credibility. 
Um, also, there was this thing in, in TV news about climate change not making for good TV stories that people would zone out and tune out. Turns out none of that was really true. <laughs> um, and, and don't get me wrong, yes, it's true in certain places, right? Certain markets in this country, there's more people who, who don't wanna hear about climate change, don't wanna talk about climate change, don't even believe that climate change is real. So it's tough in certain markets for meteorologists and they just wanna steer clear of it just to keep themselves safe. But that is changing, obviously. Uh, Climate Central has a program called Climate Matters, where there are over a thousand meteorologists who are signed up who get information every week in their inbox. I just got some uh, an hour ago. And um, we can then just use that on the air. It's pre-prepared. It's uh, in terms of like, the graphics look nice. They're, they're TV ready. It's based on real data. There's no exaggeration. It's based on real science. And meteorologists can use it and educate their audiences. So you're seeing a big uptick. And you know, this is this is a good idea for meteorologists too. Um, you know, people can use their weather apps right here. My wife tells me she uses the weather app. If my own wife is using the weather app, then then meteorologists better figure out what business they're in. And they're in the business of information, which means that they should be adding context and perspective to their weather cast to be become more relevant, not only for themselves, but for their TV stations that they represent. Well, in your assessment, is the media talking enough about climate change? Uh, at this point, uh, we're getting there. I think we're almost there. You know, there was a, there was a analysis done on, on how many, you know, how much, how many segments there were on TV that, that talked about climate change and hurricane Ida. And uh, it was done before Ida was done because Ida is still actually going on in the Northeast today. So it said very few media sources talked about it, but generally speaking, media sources don't talk about it right when it's happening. They talk about it a day after or two days after because obviously the immediate concern about Hurricane Ida is, is it gonna kill people on the coast? Let's prepare people. We can talk about climate change the day after or something like that. that that's generally what happens. And so I think, and is, and you're and you know I saw it on one of our stories on CBS News last night. Uh, we had a reporter in San Francisco covering the fires in Tahoe, and she made the connection between climate. It wasn't a meteorologist; it was a reporter. So it's happening a lot more frequently. I think people are getting it, but it is important for people to hear hear this repetitively because people have a lot going on in their life. They're trying to put food on the table. They have family problems. They have work problems. They have Lots of problems, <laughs> you know. So, so they, so to, to really care about climate change, they have to hear about it enough. So it registers high on the totem pole of uh, of concerns that they have. Well, I, I like to talk about Hurricane Ida. It, it made landfall in Louisiana on Sunday as a Category Four hurricane. And it really didn't take long for Ida to develop from a tropical storm to a Category Four hurricane. Was this quick development unusual? Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. Uh, yeah, you know, rapid intensification is something that's been happening. There's an actual definition for it. It's 35 miles an hour in 24 hours. That's how much it has to intensify. And yeah, this, this has been happening for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And it's more likely when the water is warm. But rapid intensification is becoming a lot more likely. So over the past uh, four decades, um, rapid intensification has increased five miles an hour. Uh, actually, it's 4.4 miles an hour uh, per decade. And so when you add it up over the course of four decades, instead of a storm rapidly intensifying at 40 miles an hour in 24 hours, like it would have been in the 1980s, now it rapidly intensifies by 60 miles an hour in 24 hours. And that's a, that's a big difference. So now it's 20 miles an hour stronger than it would have otherwise been. So of course, Ida would have still been a major hurricane, still caused a lot of damage. But 20 miles an hour makes a big difference. Let me tell you why. And you probably know this already if you saw my segment from a few days ago. But um, if you compare a hurricane with winds of 75 miles an hour with a hurricane of winds of 150 miles an hour, you don't double or triple or quadruple the damage. The damage, is, damage potential is 250 times higher. So that's crazy, right? But then you really think about it and you say, well, that makes sense, right? 75 mile an hour wind will wrap or, or, or rip some shingles off of off your roof, right? But probably not much more damage. 150 mile an hour wind won't just rip, rip shingles off. It'll rip the roof off and maybe destroy the structure. So you go from a few hundred dollars worth of damage to a few hundred thousand dollars worth of damage. So of course it's 250 times more damage. So yeah, so every, you know, 
five miles an hour, 10 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour it makes a big difference. And that's why climate change can be so impactful. In fact, I don't know if you saw the report that came out today from the UN that climate and weather disasters are four to five times, um, have increased by four to five times since the 1970s, four to five times more climate and weather disasters than we had in the 1970s and seven times the damage. So then how does climate change impact rapid intensification? Warm water. It's just simply that the water is warmer. So for every two degrees Fahrenheit, your hurricane can intensify 20 miles an hour more. So if a storm was gonna be a cat three, it may now be a cat four. And if it was gonna be a cat four, it may now be a cat five. Does this rapid intensification make it harder for meteorologists to predict a hurricane's strength really with enough time for people to evacuate before it makes landfall? A great point and it's true it makes it harder for meteorologists it makes it harder for the public it makes it harder for emergency managers to prepare people because if you're preparing for two and you turn around into three or four it's worse but with that said we knew exactly what i Ida would do if you watch my weathercast days leading up to ida there was a certainty in my presentation and i imagine other meteorologists too although i was doing my own weather wasn't watching other meteorologists but we were, I think, as a community, pretty certain Ida was going to rapidly intensify and that it was going to be a major hurricane at landfall. So I think people probably were decently prepared, despite the fact that they only had about two days warning or three days warning. We knew this was coming a week or two out, but the problem was it didn't actually form into a tropical system until two or three days out. We knew it was going to happen, but it doesn't become news until it happens. Hurricane Ida hit on the 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. How was Ida different than Katrina? Um, so Katrina was a, a, a stronger storm for a time over the Gulf of Mexico, but as it moved north, it weakened fairly dramatically. Um, when it hit land, it barely had winds of 125 miles an hour. When I say barely, I mean, so when it touched land, it had winds of 125, but it was weakening already. So as soon as it got on land, it weakened even more dramatically, pretty quick. Ida was a weaker storm over the Gulf, but it strengthened to 150 mile an hour winds when it hit land. So it was 25 miles an hour stronger than Katrina, but it was a strengthening storm at land. So it carried its upward intensity momentum for six hours. It was still a cat four. Katrina weakened almost immediately. We talked about that at least a day or two before it made landfall, that that would be the difference in, in between those storms. Now, because Katrina was a stronger storm over the Gulf and it had been moving slowly and it was there for two to three days, it produced a mountain of water with it and pushed that water on shore and it ended up with 28 feet of storm surge. Ida was just ramping up and building up its mountain of water when it came on shore, luckily. So it produced likely, we don't know for sure. So far, I've seen storm surge up to seven feet. I'm guessing it was probably closer to 10 to 12 feet. So its storm surge is about half uh, of Hurricane Katrina. None of that's a surprise. It produced more wind damage, lots more power outages, but it produced a um, lot less storm surge. Makes complete sense. Well, what effects will Ida have as it moves Northeast across the United States? So we're seeing it now as, as we record this. Uh, it's pouring in Pennsylvania, really heavy. Some places have already seen it close to five inches of rain. It's gonna be another several inches. Some places will probably end up tallying somewhere between five and eight inches of rain. And to have that much rain occur, and by the way, it's going to occur, well, <clears throat> National uh, Weather Service is talking about the, the period of time being 24 hours. So you see eight inches of rain in 24 hours. That's considered a once in 100 year type event for some towns. But actually, most of the rain is going to fall in about 12 hours. So I'm really curious what that time uh, interval, reoccurrence interval is probably more like once every few hundred years type, type interval. But in any event, we'll find out tonight and tomorrow just how bad it ended up being. And if there are any towns that were really impacted big by the hurt, by the heavy rain. So much of the flooding in, in systems like this is due to the intensity of rain within a short window of time. So it's, it's actually probably more significant if you get two inches of rain in an hour or four inches of rain in two hours than it would be if you get 10 inches of rain in 24 hours. Get it because it's just the rate and, and the ability of the ground to absorb. If it happens over the course of two days, it's no big deal. If it happens over the course of two hours, it's a big deal. 
Yeah, and as the East Coast gets all this rain, gets battered by the remnants of Hurricane Ida, the western part of the country is stuck in a prolonged drought that has has led to these enormous wildfires. So what's happening right now in California with the wildfires? Well, of course, last year was the worst uh, fire season in California history. This year, it rivals it. It may or may not top it. I hope it doesn't. But the Dixie Fire, I think it's probably close to 800,000 acres burned, probably just short of that. The Caldor Fire has is, is, is forced tremendous evacuations out of Lake Tahoe, uh, South, South Lake Tahoe. Um, firefighters and emergency managers are consistently saying, they're throwing up their hands and saying, we can no longer fight these fires. Um, it, it, unprecedented is not a word that is really a strong enough word to describe what's happening anymore. Uh, we don't have the resources to fight these fires and we cannot stop them like we used to 20 years ago or 10 years ago. So, you know, the bottom line here is meteorologically and climatologically, it's mostly due to warmer air evaporating the moisture from the ground. Most of it is that. So the air is drier, the ground is drier, and that's providing more fuel for these fires and they're burning at intensities we haven't really observed before. They're spreading faster, they're burning more acres that we haven't observed before. For every increase of a degree in temperature, we see an exponential increase in the acres burned. It's not linear. Um, and so, unfortunately, this is going to continue. Uh, and it's going to be hard to own a home and live in certain parts of California because A, you're not going to want to. And if you want to, B, you're going to have a hard time getting insurance or a mortgage. And that's what's going to be happening in other places, too. I mean, if I were an insurance company, I'd have a hard time insuring properties in along the coast of Louisiana, especially if it's really exposed to the coast. I mean, they've been hit with three powerful hurricanes in the past uh, year. I think four, maybe. Um, two, two or three last year. And then and I think a tropical storm as well. And then this year, this hurricane. So, you know, um, that's bad luck. To some degree, the frequency of, of a certain area being hit by by hurricanes that's that's bad luck. But but the but with the intensity ramping up of all these hurricanes, um, yeah, you know it's it's challenging to own a home in a risk uh, an area of risk like California or or the coast of, of, of the Gulf Coast or Florida. Yeah, and the IPCC 2021 climate change report that was released on August 9th stated that no matter what, no matter what we do now, the next three decades are each going to be hotter than the current decade and, and actually hotter than each other. So what should we expect from wildfires and hurricanes as the planet continues to warm for at least the next 30 years? So it's important to note this, that we don't, every single year is not going to be an unprecedented year. There are going to be some years where it's unprecedented and some years where it comes back, not to reality, because our, that, that reality we used to have decades ago, that's long gone. But we're not going to set a high bar for fires every year. We might set it again this year, which would be pretty incredible considering last year. And by the way, last year was also the record, record hurricane season, right? We're, we're not likely to, to break that this year. But, you know, there'll be more, more of those extreme years and less of those less extreme years going forward. And, and we will continue to see unprecedented things happen like the Pacific Northwest heat wave or record setting fire seasons across the West. It may not be California next year. Maybe next year it's Oregon or Washington or Colorado, you know. So, but and that, that the reason I say it that way is because just because two or let's say two or three years go by, 2025 and 2026 are not that bad. That means nothing in the whole scheme of things, because ultimately it will be worse. You know, at, you know, there's always going to be lulls in activity. We hope. I can't even be sure of that, but that's that's likely what's going to happen. But we can't let our guard down if that were to happen for you. Well, earlier this year, the bootleg, the bootleg fire in Oregon actually created its own weather pattern. How how is that possible? Well, we're seeing that happen now in almost every fire. So it's it's not just the bootleg fire. We, we've seen it in the Calder fire. These fires are so intense and so hot. And, and first, let me just say, fires have been creating their own weather probably for millennia. But it's happening in almost every fire now. That's the difference. So what's happening is you get so much intense heat in these fires that you get rapidly, rapidly rising air. It causes these pyrocumulus or 
paracumulonimbus clouds. Now, a paracumulonimbus cloud is a thunder, a cumulonimbus cloud is a thunderstorm cloud, and it produces its own lightning. So now you have a thunderstorm, which can sometimes spin. They can sometimes produce tornadoes. So fire tornadoes is fairly new to the vernacular, but it's happening a lot. I've seen a bunch of videos recently posted. And these thunderstorms, which don't have any rain, by the way, they're just fire thunderstorms, smoke thunderstorms. They produce their own lightning, which causes new fires to, to spark. Fires are jumping fire lines, crossing roads, and embers are creating fires miles away now. That's what happened in, in, in the South Lake Tahoe situation, where the fire just, just somehow made it over the ridge. And by the way, the area where the fires are burning right now, there's two, the Dixie and Calder fire. Uh, I've heard the officials there say that this is the first time this particular part of the northern, you know, uh, Sierra Nevada near Tahoe and, and areas north have seen fires like this kind of cross the ridges. And they're both in the same year, 2021, at the same time. Wow. I mean, it's it all sounds so scary. And one of the scarier things that I've heard recently is the potential collapse of the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. And I probably butchered the pronunciation of oh, you that. You did a good job. You did a good job. <laughs> but uh, first, what, what is that? So the AMOC is the Atlantic multi-decadal overturning oscillation. Uh, actually, actually, no, 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 meridional. I'm sorry. There's two different things that happen in the Atlantic. There's the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, and then there's the AMOC, which is the Atlantic meridional overturning uh, circulation. Anyway, none of that's material. We call it the Gulf Stream system. Uh, if you're a scientist and you call it the Gulf Stream system, it's probably a better way to communicate because it's easier for everyone, right? Uh, the Gulf Stream system transports a ton of, of, of warm uh, water to the north. And it actually is responsible for redistributing 20% of the heat that's redistributed from the equator to the poles on Earth, that one current. So you can imagine how important that is in kind of equalizing the playing field between how hot it is at the equator and how cold it is at the poles. You need that, otherwise it gets to be a million degrees at the equator and a million below, I'm exaggerating, at the poles, but you get what I'm saying. Um, so this circulation is weakening and the reason why it's weakening is because Greenland is melting, and because precipitation is increasing in the North Atlantic. Both of these are injecting fresh water into the North Atlantic. Now, in the North Atlantic, there's the reason for the overturning in the circulation is because it's the water there is heavy, it's dense, it's cold, and it's salty. It's salty because it comes from the Gulf of Mexico and the salt water content there is a little bit higher. So that comes up the Eastern seaboard and it, and it cools. So now you have cold, salty water which sinks in the North Atlantic straight down. But now all this fresh water from the melting of Greenland and the, you know, the rain, the extra rain that we're seeing in the North Atlantic, that is making the water more fresh, not as heavy. And that's reducing the propensity for this water to sink. So it's not sinking as fast. And that slows down the overturn or it slows down the conveyor belt. It slows down the whole circulation because it just doesn't have its machine anymore. It doesn't have its engine to kind of push it along. So that slowdown has, I think, I think it's slowed down by about 15% over the past 50 years. And it used to be that the IPC, IPCC just a few years ago said that it would be hundreds of years before this circulation collapsed. Now they're saying we can't guarantee it won't collapse. You know, they're saying there's only a medium chance it won't collapse. Whereas years ago, they believed that the chances of collapse were very minimal. And if it did happen, it'd be hundreds of years in the future. So this collapse wouldn't happen tomorrow. It would happen um, hundreds, hundreds of years in the future, we would hope, but, it's, but now they're saying it could be decades. That's, that's the problem. And by the way, a, a report just came out that right whales are in trouble. It's partly due to currents that are changing off the coast of Maine and in the North Atlantic. There are only 500 right whales left in the world, or let me correct that, there were only 500. Now there are only about 350. And the science says that there is a risk of extinction. Uh, of these whales because of changing ocean currents in the North Atlantic. But forget about right whales, it's a big issue for us too, because it would change if, if, the, if, the, if the Atlantic current completely stopped, it collapsed or dramatically slowed down. It would throw weather patterns completely off kilter across the North Atlantic in Europe, and it would change uh, productivity in the ocean. So phytoplankton and 
everything that relies on fighter ranking it would, it would have great impacts to that as well. So we don't want that to happen. Well, meteorologists have a huge responsibility of notifying and preparing people for upcoming weather events. But do you think Americans or people across the world are prepared for the damage that these extreme weather events are going to cause over the next three decades or more? No, I don't think so. I think economically, it's, it's really a big challenge. People don't want to spend a lot of money on insurance, so often people are uninsured. And if when these one when one of the and they take their chances and when one of these disasters happen, it can wipe out their life savings. They may not have another place to go. Uh, do you know that um, weather and climate disasters uh, actually displace more people than war and conflict now by a dramatic margin? By the way, that was a UN report that came out maybe six months ago. I don't remember exactly when. Um, and of course, it affects the people with the least means the most. And they're actually the least who caused climate change. You know, climate change is caused by the richest of, of nations and people, not by the poor. But it's often the underserved that are, that are most impacted by climate change. So no, people aren't ready for the threat from extreme weather. And what society really isn't prepared for is climate migration. Because right now, you know, it's already a politically charged um, conversation. Can you imagine what it's going to be like 30 years from now when people have to move because of sea level rise, because they can't live in places that are prone to hurricanes or heat waves anymore, agriculture won't grow where they typically farm, and so they're forced to move within their country or outside of their country. Now people are knocking on every other country's door, and other countries don't want them, you know, and now it creates international conflict. So it's a big national security issue, too. Well, your work is so inspiring, and the fact that you know you you really uh, risk your career by by changing things, by changing the direction direction of your career. And Why did I do that on climate? <laughs> I did that because it was the right thing to do. The right and, thing to do. It's really that simple. Yeah, and and we are so glad that you did because, like I said before, you're consistently talking about climate change on national television, like it's never been talked about before. I know right now is an extremely busy time for you. So I really appreciate you coming on the Climate Pod and talking to me. Jeff Beardelli, thank you again for joining the Climate Pod. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.